Cupcakes and Kisses, by Victorine E. Liskey. Chapter 1. Candace pulled the last batch of cupcakes from the oven and breathed in the smell of melted chocolate chips infused into the soft spongy cake. This was one of her best batches. She was going to rock this order. And she really needed to, if her bakery was going to survive. The last thing her father had said to her before he passed was, take your inheritance and make your dreams come true. Too bad he'd been joking. Harold Griffin never had two dimes to rub together. Ironically, because of the greedy man who ordered this very batch of cupcakes. Candace made a face as she spread frosting on the already cooled ones. If he wasn't such an influential man in town, she might have refused the order. But staying open was more important than her pride. Her father had been involved in an accident twenty years ago, and because the great Liam Russell had more money and a great lawyer, he'd gotten a huge judgment against her father. Their family had been paying the price for it ever since. No, sadly, there was no large inheritance to help her get her dream shop started. Candace had worked two jobs and saved every penny for five years to finally have enough to rent this adorable space. And she loved it, from the red and white checkered curtains to the cute bell on the front door. It was a perfect home for cupcake bliss. Her gaze darted to the window. The snow hadn't slowed down. If anything, it was coming down even stronger. Two to three inches? Yeah, right. They probably already had four inches outside. The weatherman could go jump in Lake Chicago. He was never right. The bell sounded and she set down her last cupcake to wipe her hands on a towel, then rush into the shop. Usually Debbie helped in the afternoons, but she was apparently running late. Probably trying to unbury her car. When Candace saw who had come in, she froze. Daniel. She hadn't seen him in a couple of months, but her body still had that same visceral reaction. Her palms grew sweaty and her heart rate picked up speed. Note to self, Daniel broke up with you. Stomped on your heart. You can stop reacting to him. Hello, she said in the most cheerful voice she could muster. She curled a strand of her blonde hair over behind her ear. He looked up from the counter and brushed a few flakes of snow from his hair. Hi, Candy. She cringed. She'd always hated that nickname. Candace was a proper name. The name of a woman who owned a bakery. Candy sounded like she had no brains. But Daniel kept calling her that, even after she told him it made her sound like a pole dancer. Candace didn't want to read anything into his showing up in the middle of a snowstorm. And today, of all days. The 23rd of December. The day they met, one year ago. No, she didn't want to hold out for any hope that he was coming to apologize. To admit he'd been wrong. To beg for her back in his life. Candace swallowed and took a step toward the cash register. What's up, Daniel? I need half a dozen of your candy cane cupcakes. And then another half dozen of your Santa hat chocolate ones. And then a dozen sugar cookies. She raised an eyebrow. Having a party? He leaned against the antique table she'd found at a little shop in Long Grove last week. Amy wanted to invite a few people over. A little Friday night get-together. Candace stood there, staring at him like an idiot. Amy, the girl who lived in his apartment building, who was always flirting with him. That Amy? Was he dating her now? She plastered on a smile. Of course. Amy. Danielle squinted at her. You did know she and I are engaged, right? Engaged? Her vision blurred and she couldn't breathe. She dated Daniel for ten months, fell in love with him, and thought they'd eventually get married. But he never wanted to talk about their future. She thought he had commitment issues. Now, two months after he broke it off with her, he was engaged to Amy from the third floor. She felt like she was going to faint. Or throw up. But she couldn't do that. She had to push through. 
Candace shook her head but left the now probably scary-looking smile on. No. I didn't. Daniel puffed out his chest, and Candace got the distinct impression he was there for one thing. To brag to her that he'd found someone else so quickly. He still leaned on her table. She wanted to tell him to get his grubby paws off. It was an 18th-century English cricket table. A rare find. I'm sorry, he said in a fake sweet voice. I thought you knew. It's okay, she said quickly, grabbing a box and shoving cupcakes in. You don't have to explain. A smug smile crept onto his face. Amy and I have a lot in common. Candace gritted her teeth. I said you don't have to explain. Okay. I just didn't want you to think. I don't think anything, Daniel. I just make desserts. She finished loading the cupcakes, closed the box, and reached for the sugar cookies. The faster she got him all settled up, the faster she could go in the back and scream out her frustrations. Or eat a pound of chocolate. Whichever. I'm sorry, he said, almost purring. I shouldn't have come in. Amy just said, get gluten-free, and the bakery on 51st didn't have any. I know all you make are gluten-free, Anne. Daniel, she said, maybe a tad bit too loud. He stopped and stared at her. She smiled again, even though her cheeks hurt. It's okay. Just take them. She handed him the two boxes and rang up the order. Thanks, Candy. Candace winced. Not only did he have to come in and rub it in her face that he was already happily in love with someone else, he insisted on demeaning her with that stupid nickname. She took his check and slid it into the cash drawer. Happy holidays, she forced herself to say. Maybe he would leave now. But before her wish came true, he reached out and grabbed her hand, then placed his other one on top. She was trapped, standing there, feeling like she was going to be sick. He leaned in closer. I appreciate this. She yanked her hand back, shaking from the contact. No problem, she muttered as she backed toward the kitchen. See you around, he said. I hope not, she said under her breath. She turned and shoved her way back into the kitchen, blinking so the tears wouldn't come. How had she ever seen anything in him? And how could she have thought maybe he was coming to apologize? He was nothing but an inconsiderate louse. She grabbed a cupcake and started slathering it with frosting. Of all the mean things Daniel had ever done, this one topped them all. He was a selfish jerk. It was obvious he was just there to flaunt Amy in her face. Why did she care so much, anyway? Stupid emotions. Candace slowed as she realized her cupcakes were looking less like Santa hats and more like blood pools. Oh, no. She couldn't mess up this order for Mr. Russell. She needed the money. And who cared about Daniel, anyway? He was long gone, out of her life. She wouldn't even waste another second thinking about him. At least, that's what she told herself. Over and over. Chapter 2 After another hour of work, Mr. Russell's large order was done, in boxes, and on her cart. All thoughts of Daniel had gone. At least, that's what she wanted. In truth, her fingers still shook from anger. From what he did to her. But she tried to ignore it. Debbie had shown up and was out front running the shop so Candace could deliver the order. She pulled on her coat and wheeled the cart to the back door. Unfortunately, the snow had blown over the path she'd scooped to her van just ten minutes before. She couldn't push the cart to her van. She cringed and ran each box out through the biting wind while trying not to slip on the ice. At least she'd taken out the back seats of her van last week so she could go antiquing. It made it easier to load. After she climbed in the driver's side and started the car, she glanced at the clock. Three minutes to five? How did it get to be so late? Mr. Russell had said he wanted the cupcakes delivered before five. 
nerves clenched her stomach. If she didn't please him, her business could be toast. He was a very influential man. She'd never met him, but he and his family were well known around Chicago. There was no way she'd make it on time. She still had to get downtown, then up to the 68th floor where the Christmas party would be held. She just hoped that Mr. Russell would be busy enough with his business party that he wouldn't notice her coming in late. Candace did her best to drive fast on the slippery streets while not getting stuck in the snowdrifts. When she arrived at the horrendously high building, she parked and ran to the back of her van. She rushed to get the cupcake boxes out without smushing them. It seemed to take forever to get them into the building and on her cart. Once she was done, she rushed to the elevator. The building seemed unusually still. No one was around. Not that she knew much to compare it to. She never came in this building. She avoided it on principle. It was built on the dollars taken from their family. Desperation made a person do all kinds of things they never thought they'd do, huh? The elevator took forever, and she danced from one foot to the other, trying to get the blood flowing again. Her toes were frozen. She didn't want to look at the clock, but her gaze landed there, anyway. 5.20. She took a cleansing breath as the elevator finally opened its doors. Maybe Liam Russell would be forgiving because of the snowstorm. She wheeled her cart onto the elevator and then pressed the button marked 68. The door started to slide shut when she heard a man yell out, hold the elevator. She pressed the door open button, but the doors kept sliding shut. She frantically pressed it over and over. Then she realized she was pressing the wrong one. Oops. Oh, well. She was in a hurry, anyway. He could catch the next one. Just as the doors were about to close all the way, the man stuck his foot in, and they opened back up again. He stepped onto the elevator, a frown stretching across his face. Thanks for holding the elevator, he grumbled. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button, she said, feeling lame. He shrugged, then smoothed out his features. It's okay. He took the normal elevator stance as they started to rise. Feet apart. Hands clasped in front of him. He wore a nice suit with a few flakes of snow on his shoulders. He was handsome, probably in his early thirties. And tall. She tried not to stare at him. It was awkward enough with the whole door almost closing thing. Then her mind woke up and she pointed to the buttons. Which floor do you need? He pointed with his chin. That's my floor. 68. Die. She should have known. The whole building looked like it was empty. It was the Friday before Christmas. Everyone probably went home early. Except for those staying for the party. It looked like this guy needed to relax. His jaw was set, his hands clenched tight. It's a good thing Christmas is almost here, she said, trying to lighten the mood. We all get a break. He nodded, not saying anything. The lights flickered, and the elevator lurched, but resumed its course as the lights came back full force. Candace gripped her cart. Geez, what was that? The snow, I'm sure. She swallowed. Sure. The snow. Well, I hope it doesn't shut the power down. I hate blackouts. Or at least, she hoped it waited until she was out of this building. She didn't want to get trapped on the 68th floor. The man pointed to her cart. You're from the bakery. It wasn't a question, but she nodded, anyway. Yes. He frowned. You're late. Wow. How rude. She held back a rude comment of her own. The snowstorm made it impossible to get here. Impossible? He raised one eyebrow. Yeah, okay, so impossible was an exaggeration. But his arrogance was off-putting. She pinched her lips together and looked him over. You're late, too. 
Unless Mr. Bossman sent you out for something. Wait, let me guess. Mr. Russell sent you out in this weather for some mistletoe? Sounds like something he'd do. She chuckled to herself. The man took a step back from her, staring, his lips twitching like he was holding back a smile. Oh, really? Yeah. I've heard he was a real piece of work. Old men with tons of money usually are. His eyes widened. Old? The lights flickered again, then went out completely, and the elevator slammed to a halt. She lost her balance and screamed. Chapter 3 Strong arms wrapped around Candace and steadied her in the dark. Her heart pounded as she clung to the stranger. Embarrassed, she let him go and stepped back. Uh, thanks, she said, her voice shaky. He didn't acknowledge her gratitude. I'm sure the power will come back on in a second. She held her breath, waiting for that exact thing. One red light in the upper corner kept them from being in complete darkness, and her eyes adjusted to the odd lighting. The man glanced at the doors, like he wasn't sure why they didn't open. Dang, why did the power have to go out right now, of all times? She had stuff to do. With Christmas Eve tomorrow, she knew she'd have some last-minute shoppers coming in for treats for their parties. She had to get back to the shop. The power isn't coming back on, she said after a minute. Then she winced. That was a stupid thing to say. Hello, Captain Obvious. He chuckled. It's okay. Don't stress. Sure. Don't stress. She rubbed her arms, even though she still had her coat on. It suddenly felt colder in the elevator. We're fine. It's not like we're trapped in here, hours before one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Power outages don't usually last long. I'm sure we'll be up and running in no time. She held her breath as the seconds ticked by. He was right. She'd been in a few power outages in Chicago, but sometimes they had it fixed in just minutes. Sometimes, hours. But she'd never been in one that lasted days. They'd be fine. The power would come back on soon and her day would continue as normal. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. He took a couple of steps and, for the first time, she noticed he favored one leg. He leaned against the side of the elevator. So, you own a bakery? She nodded. Yeah. I'm just starting out. Opened six months ago. What's your best seller? She grinned at him. My cupcakes. And I love making them. There's just something about baking a batch of cupcakes, then decorating them so they turn out cute, that makes me get all excited. Her cheeks heated. And now I'm rambling about stuff you probably don't care at all about. His lips curled up a little. No, you're fine. You're obviously passionate about what you do. And what is it you do? He shifted. I own a company myself. But I want to hear more about your business. What made you want to open a bakery? I just love putting together ingredients to make something delicious. I've been creating since I was a teen. And there's something so satisfying about tasting what you've made and enjoying every bite. He nodded. I agree. She suddenly felt stupid. I'm sorry. We're stuck in an elevator together and I don't even know your name. She stuck out her hand to him. I'm Candace. He hesitated, then shook her hand and smiled. Nice to meet you, Candace. I'm Liam. Liam? You work for Liam Russell, and you have the same name as him? That's got to be confusing. Even as the words came out of her mouth, she knew she was wrong. A numb feeling spread through her chest as she stared at the man. Oh, no. This couldn't be. He couldn't be. He cleared his throat, looking somewhat uncomfortable. I have the same name as him, because I am him. Oh. That was all she could say. 
all that would come out of her stupidly slack mouth. What had she done? She'd made snide comments, right to his face. What must he think of her? She'd just killed her whole business. He was going to tell everyone what a numbskull she was, and her business would be toast. She'd lose her investment. He stepped toward the elevator buttons. Maybe we should use the phone to call someone. Let them know we're trapped. Yes. Her voice came out a strangled whisper. Go ahead. He opened the tiny door and picked up the handset. After a moment, he spoke. This is Liam Russell. I was in one of the west elevators when the power went out. As he talked, she wondered if she could turn invisible, just by sheer will. Uh, huh. He listened some more to the person on the other end of the line. All right. Thank you. He hung up and turned to Candace. She will put in the call, but there was a huge accident on the freeway and most responders are dealing with that right now. She said to hold tight, and they'd come help soon if the power doesn't come back on first. Oh. Candace didn't know what else to say. She felt like a fool. Maybe she could fake a heart attack and then the rescue crew would come faster. She wondered what a fake heart attack would look like. He walked back to the railing on the wall where he'd been leaning, and once again, she noticed his limp. He smiled at her. Listen, I don't want things to be awkward between us. I know you didn't know who I was when you said those things. Heat pricked at her cheeks. Yeah. It's fine. People say all kinds of things about me. I don't care. He waved away the imaginary comments people make, like they were pesky flies. But I do have one question, if you don't mind. Oh, no. Would this humiliation never end? She swallowed and avoided eye contact. Okay. What made you think I was old? What was she supposed to say to that? She shrugged. I honestly don't know. He shifted. How old did you think I was? Candace cringed. I guess, in your seventies. Maybe? He rubbed his chin. Maybe my ex was right. Maybe I need to use more moisturizer. She wasn't sure he was kidding until she saw the hint of a smile on his face, and then she laughed, feeling foolish. I'm sorry. I really don't know what I was thinking. All I've ever known of you was from. She stopped abruptly. Crap. She didn't want to tell him about her father. About the accident and the judgment. She didn't want to bring up any of that. But now he was looking at her expectantly. From, he prodded. Uh, from what people say about your company. And I guess I just assumed. She finished with a lame shoulder shrug. A light came on in his eyes. Ah, uh, my company. You mean, my father's company. You must have me confused with him. Oh. Well, that totally made sense. People confuse me with my father all the time. At least, they did when he was still alive. Candace swallowed, and awkwardness settled between them. I'm sorry. It's okay. It was hard when he first passed, but I've made peace with it. He shifted his weight. Do you mind if I sit down? My leg is bothering me. Did she mind? Of course not. She motioned. Go ahead. In fact, I'll join you. She sat down as well, leaning her back up against the side of the elevator. It felt good to get off her feet. How long had they been in there, anyway? She pulled out her phone and checked the time. Fifteen minutes. Is that all? It had seemed like longer. Do you need to call anyone? Let them know where you are. Liam asked. Debbie was manning the store until six. She'd lock up and not think anything about Candace not coming back, probably assuming she'd gone home for the day. She had no boyfriend. No parents. 
A strange loneliness settled around Candace as she shook her head. No. He didn't say anything, and she realized she hadn't seen him take out a phone. She held hers to him. What about you? You can use my phone. He took it from her. Thank you. I left my phone in my office. I should let my mother know where I am. He punched in a number and held the phone to his ear. Hi. Yes, I know. I'm in the elevator. Candace could hear the excited tone of his mother's voice carrying through the air. Liam grimaced. I'm fine, mother. I called. They will come soon. He nodded. Yes. I love you, too. Goodbye. He hung up and handed her phone back to her. Thanks. As she took the phone, his fingers brushed over hers and a jolt of electricity sparked over her skin. Man, she needed to get out more, if this man's touch could do that to her. How pathetic. Chapter 4 Time seemed to crawl as they sat in the elevator. At 6 o'clock, Candace started to get worried. How long would it take for the power to come back on? It was cold. Plus, she was getting hungry. Liam must have been thinking the same thing because he pointed to the cart full of boxes. They smell good. She gave him a devilish smile. Do you want one? Well, we are stuck. I don't see why we shouldn't eat one. Candace was happy to oblige. She grabbed one of the boxes and slid it onto the floor between them. She opened the lid. Liam picked up one of the Santa cupcakes and peeled the paper off. Candace didn't mean to stare at him, but she always felt a bit self-conscious when someone tried one of her creations, and she sat still while he took a bite. He raised his eyebrows. This is delicious. Then he motioned to her. Aren't you going to have one? Relief flooded over her, and she picked one up. Yes. The elevator fell into a silence as they ate. Liam crumpled his liner and slid it into his suit pocket. I thought I ordered gluten-free cupcakes. Maybe the order got messed up. She shook her head. No, these are gluten-free. His eyebrows shot up. Really? They don't taste like it. Satisfaction pulled warm in her stomach. Good. Everything I make is gluten-free. I try hard to create wonderful tasting treats. What's your secret? I've had a lot of gluten-free desserts, and they usually are dry and crumbly. But yours is perfect. Candace swallowed her last bite, so thrilled he would notice. The secret is adding in moisture. I used applesauce in this recipe. He slowly nodded. That makes sense. Do you bake? Actually, I do. It relaxes me. I've made some gluten-free cupcakes, but none of them came out this nice. You must know someone with celiac. My mother. He reached out and grabbed another cupcake. How did you know it wasn't me? Because when you thought you were eating a gluten-filled cupcake, you didn't spit it out. He left. You're right. And perceptive. He took a bite of the cupcake. When he had swallowed, he pointed to her. What about you? Do you have celiac? Nope. My best friend growing up had it. That's interesting. No one in your family? Candace shook her head. Nope. He studied her. And now you run a gluten-free bakery. I saw a need and tried to fill it. When I was growing up, I watched Kristen struggle with what she could eat. At birthday parties, everyone would be eating cake. Except Kristen. And then there was the year I asked my dad to make a gluten-free cake. Candace made a face, remembering how bad it was. It tasted awful. Liam chuckled. Must have been from a mix. Yes. I was appalled. So, 
I decided I was going to make a gluten-free cake that didn't taste like it belonged in the garbage. I played around with different recipes, read a lot, and figured out a combination that was good. And then I did the same thing with brownies. And cookies. And by the time I had graduated college, my dream to open up an entire gluten-free bakery was born. He paused, his cupcake halfway to his mouth. He swallowed. Don't tell me you're fresh out of college. She left. No. Unfortunately, my dream had to wait until I had capital. But I'm thinking I should be offended at that question. He held up a hand, his face turning red. I didn't mean, you just seemed to be. Oh, the poor guy looked really uncomfortable. She should put him out of his misery. Relax. You're fine. I know I don't look like a 20-something. As long as you don't think I look like a 40-something, we're good. She raised one eyebrow at him. No. Definitely not a 40-something. He finished eating his cupcake. Are you going to eat another? Because I might start to feel self-conscious if I'm the only one eating these like they're potato chips. He picked up a third. She smiled at him. Go ahead. You're paying for them. Might as well eat them. I think I've had my fill, for the time being. If we're still in here tomorrow morning, I'll probably have eaten my way through a box or two, though. Oh, I hope we're not stuck in here until tomorrow. He paused, then seemed to think about what he said. Not that sitting here talking to you isn't enjoyable. I know what you mean. I'm trying really hard not to think of what would happen if we're trapped here for an extended period of time. And not to think about the business she'd lose if she weren't able to get to work tomorrow. Let's get our minds off the fact that we're trapped. He finished the cupcake and closed the box, sliding it onto the cart. As he leaned on his knee, he winced and shifted his weight. Let's play a game. A game? Candace wasn't sure what to think about that. Maybe this man wasn't as stuffy as she'd originally thought. Yeah. Let's play, he put his hand in his pocket. What's in your pocket? She held back a laugh. That's a game? Sure. It can be. I have some things in my pockets. And I think you probably do, too. Let's try to guess what's in each other's pockets. What a strange thing for a CEO to want to do. But she was up for the challenge. She already knew he had stuck his cupcake wrappers in there. All right. I have a guess. Already? Yep. He rubbed his hands together. Okay. You can go first. What do you think is in my pocket? Cupcake wrappers. He laughed and pulled the three wrappers out that he'd stuck in there. Okay, cheater. I'll give you a point even though you watched me put them in. She spread her hands out. Hey, you're the one who wanted to play. You're right. Now it's my turn. His gaze traveled over her red pea coat. He squinted at her. You have a tissue in your pocket. Candace reached in and pulled one out. Luckily, it was clean. She would have been mortified if it hadn't been. How did you do that? He chuckled. My mother always has tissues. Especially in the winter. All right. Do I get another guess, then? Yep. She looked him over. It was a nice suit. Tailored. His shoes were expensive, she could tell, now that she was examining them close up. What would he have in his pocket? Then her gaze landed on his lapel pocket. A handkerchief. He shook his head. No. She pointed, unable to keep the smug smile from her face. Yes, you have one right there. He looked down at the tuft of purple coming from his lapel pocket. He snorted. Cheating again. It's a pocket. You didn't say it had to be a certain kind of pocket. He rolled his eyes. 
All right. Two points against one point. But this time I'm going to blow you away. He gave her a sideways glance. You have a piece of gum in your pocket. She shook her head. Nope. You lose. What? No gum? How about a mint? Are you trying to get more food out of me? You didn't answer the question. She fished around in her coat pocket and pulled out a mint. All right, I have a mint, but you originally said gum. And your guesses haven't been true guesses. She huffed and tossed the mint at him. Okay. I'll give you the point. His grin stretched across his face. Now, your turn. You have to really guess this time. She made a face, then settled in on trying to figure out what a guy would have in his pocket. A wallet? Would he be carrying one around at work, though? Maybe car keys. He was just coming in from outside. He must have keys of some kind on him. She bit her lower lip and took the plunge. Keys? Good guess. His grin widened. But no. What? She didn't believe him. How did you get here if you didn't drive? Who says I didn't drive? Well, you have to have car keys if you drove. He held his palms up. Some cars are keyless. She huffed. You have a key FOB in your pocket, then. He pulled one out and tossed it on the floor between them. Yes, I do. But it's not keys, so no point. Oh, for Pete's sake. It's called a key FOB. Key is in the name. It's probably got a key inside it. You have to count it. Wait. He put up a hand. A key inside it? Yes. Many of them have keys. He gave her a skeptical look. Why would there be a key inside it? As a backup. If the battery goes out. He stared at her, as if he couldn't figure out if she was pulling his leg or not. Show me. She rolled her eyes and grabbed the key FOB. My ex had a keyless car. He showed me how to get the emergency key out. She turned over the FOB and looked for the seam. Here. We just have to pry it open. Uh, huh. She started to lose confidence as he sat and stared at her like she had three heads. But she pried open the FOB, anyway, and a triumphant, huh, came out as she showed him the key inside. His mouth popped open. Where do you put it? I don't have a key on the ignition. There's usually a place somewhere on the steering wheel. Candace gave him a cocky grin. So, another point for me. He groaned. All right. I'll count it, but you're cheating through this entire game. You must make it up to me. She wasn't sure what he meant by that. How? If we ever get out of here, you must show me how to make those delicious cupcakes. Candace's heart sped up. Was he asking for a date? Like, a baking date? She wasn't sure, but he did look like he was flirting a little bit. She swallowed, then mentally shook sense into her head. It couldn't be anything. He wasn't coming on to her. She was reading way too much into it. He was a powerful CEO, and she was a baker, for heaven's sake. He just wanted to know how to make the cupcakes for his mother. She nodded. All right. Deal. Chapter 5 Candace lay on her back, her legs up and resting on the wall. Liam lay beside her in the same position. He said it was some kind of yoga pose that would relieve stress, and surprisingly, it felt like it was working. They now had been trapped for an hour. Do you think your employees are still partying upstairs? Or did they all tromp down 68 flights of stairs? My mother said everyone was staying put until the power comes back on. Did you have booze? He looked at her. Of course. Then, yeah. 
they're going to stay put. She smirked at him, and he laughed. It grew silent for a moment. Liam stared up at the ceiling. So, tell me more about yourself, Candace. All I know is that you own a gluten-free bakery because your friend had celiac. What do you want to know? You can ask anything, but I'll warn you, I'm pretty boring. He smiled and turned to her. Are you seeing anyone? Whoa. That was a loaded question. She wasn't sure what to think about him asking that. He couldn't be asking because he was interested in her. That seemed odd. But yet, why else would he ask? No, she said quietly. Sore subject? He was perceptive. She swallowed, trying not to think too much about Daniel. The last thing she wanted to do was start crying in front of Liam. I just found out today that my ex got engaged to another woman. Ouch. Yeah. And to make it worse, today is the anniversary of the day we met. Liam winced. You are having a bad day, aren't you? She forced a laugh. You could say that. We'll just have to try to make it a better day from here on out. She gave him a funny look. We're trapped in an elevator. I know. But maybe this is a good thing. Would you have taken a moment to relax, put your feet up, and center yourself at home? No. I'd be curled up on the couch with a hot beverage and a movie going. And that sounds pretty perfect to me. She smiled. But thanks for trying. What are your plans for Christmas? Candace had been pushing all thoughts of the day away. She couldn't forget it altogether, not with everyone ordering decorated cupcakes and cookies, but she'd steeled herself for her first holiday that she'd truly be alone. She steepled her fingers. I'm going to enjoy the day off. Do you have family here in the city? Her gut twisted. No. A sadness entered his eyes. You're spending Christmas alone? She tried to ignore the stinging feeling in her throat. It will be nice, she said, probably more to convince herself than him. No shop to open. I can stay in my pajamas and be lazy. I'll curl up in a blanket and not have to shovel snow. Liam looked like he wanted to say something, but didn't. Instead, he quit the yoga pose. He stood up for a moment, walked around a little, then sat back down. She sat up as well and crossed her legs. Liam slid his shoes off. I hope you don't mind. These shoes hurt my feet. He tossed them in the corner of the elevator. I don't mind. Liam smiled. So, you don't have family in the city. Where do they live? Candace wanted to get off the subject of her being alone in the world. I don't have family, she said, simply. What about you? Do you have a big family get-together planned for Sunday? He paused, his gaze softening, before he nodded. I have four uncles. And even though I'm an only child, I have a ton of cousins. Our Christmas celebration stretches out for three days. She gasped. Holy cow. Three days? Like, you open presents for three days? He laughed and shook his head. No. We cook, play family games, watch Christmas movies, and generally stuff ourselves silly. Sounds lovely. He hesitated, then met her gaze. You should join us. Embarrassment heated her face. She didn't need a pity invite. Plus, there was no way she was going to spend the holidays with the family who had sucked money from her father for practically her whole life. She scoffed. No, you don't want a stranger there, getting in the way. He genuinely looked hurt. You're not a stranger. We've been talking for over two hours. You still think of me as a stranger? I don't know anything about you. He slowly nodded. You're right. I should remedy that. He held out his hand. I'm Liam. Feeling stupid, she rolled her eyes. I know. 
just shake my hand. His lips tugged, like he wanted to smile, but was holding back. He looked at her and even in the dark she could see he had brown eyes. They were smiling at her. It would be rude to leave him hanging, she supposed. She reached out and grasped his hand. Man, your hand is warm. And you're freezing. He placed his other hand around hers, and the heat traveled up her arm. And tingles. What was wrong with her? Thanks, she said after a second of him warming up her hand. It's better now. She pulled back and he let go. Give me your other one. She did as he said, holding back a gasp as his touch affected her skin once again. He scooted a bit closer to her, continuing to hold her hand. Okay. Since you know nothing about me, I'll start with my childhood. She was concentrating too much on not letting him see how his touch was making her feel, that she just nodded. I was born here in Chicago. I was an only child, but never alone, with lots of cousins around. But you already know that part. She smiled at him. Mm hmm. When I was twelve, I was in a car accident. Her heart stopped and her mouth went dry. Was this the same accident her father was involved in? Was he going to brag about all the money his family made from suing her father? She felt sick, but he probably didn't notice, as he kept talking. A car ran a stoplight, and my side of the vehicle was hit. Candace's vision blurred. Her father had never told her details about the accident. He'd never wanted to talk about it. He was at fault? Liam's gaze fell to the floor. I was pinned in. They had to use the jaws of life to get me out. My right leg was broken in so many places, it was practically shattered. She sucked in a breath. Dear heavens. I was in the hospital for eight months. I had multiple surgeries on my leg. The doctors didn't think I would ever walk again. Candace swallowed and pulled her hand back from him. She couldn't take the contact anymore. Her father had done this to him. She'd resented Liam Russell her whole life because she had thought he had taken what didn't belong to him. A stroke of good fortune, and he'd taken advantage, like those people who trip in front of a store and sue to get a million dollars. She had no idea what he'd gone through. That's horrible, she whispered. I proved them wrong, he said quietly. It must have hurt. Every second of every day. He glanced down at his leg. Still does. How long did it take to walk again? He met her gaze. Two years. You must have been very determined. If I learned one thing from my father, it was how to be determined. It seemed like there was a story behind that one, but Candace let it go. She stared down at her hands. I bet all that time in the hospital cost a lot of money. Liam nodded. We had a lot we had to pay out of pocket because my father was self-employed and didn't have great medical insurance. Guilt weighed heavy in her gut. She'd misjudged the situation. And blamed him for something he had no control over. I'm sure that was hard. I was young. I didn't understand any of it. All I knew was I couldn't play outside with my friends because some man named Harold Griffin ran a red light. She bit her lip hard and then tasted blood. No one had ever said her father's name like that to her before. He was a kind man. Well liked. No one spoke of him with what sounded like disdain. What would he say if he found out Harold Griffin was her father? She decided changing the subject was the best thing she could do. She couldn't take hearing any more about the accident. Where did you go to college? Stanford. What about you? I went to the community college in Palatine. What did you study? I took some business classes. How did the conversation swing back to her? She was tired of talking about herself. Plus, she only went for two years. Her college experience was very different than his, she was sure of it. So, 
After college you started working for LSR Industries? Not right away. I kind of wanted to make my own mark on the world, you know? He smoothed the fabric of his dress pants. But after working for a different company for a few years, my father got sick and pleaded with me to come work for him. To learn the company so I could eventually take over. That must have been hard. He looked at her. It was. But it was a blessing as well. I had six years working closely with my father before he passed on. Those years wouldn't have happened if I had been stubborn and insisted on going my own way. Do you love your job? Liam seemed to study the question. I do in some ways. In other ways, it's a strain. How so? Big shoes to fill. She nodded. She knew kind of what that was like. If her shop didn't survive, she knew her father would be disappointed. Not in her. Never in her. But he wanted this for her, and she knew he was up in heaven, smiling down on her, cheering her on. Chapter 6 Another fifteen minutes had passed, and Candace was starting to get seriously cold. Her teeth kept wanting to chatter. She didn't want Liam to know, though, so she decided to mask her frigid state by saying she wanted to walk around and stretch her muscles. She paced back and forth in the small space. Liam sat with his knees up, leaning against the wall, his gaze following her movements. She wanted to blow heat onto her hands, but instead, shoved them into her coat pockets. Are you cold? Candace froze. Maybe she wasn't doing as good of a job as she thought she was. Why do you ask? His eyes smiled at her. Come here. She didn't want him to warm her hands. That was embarrassing. She shook her head. I'm fine. He rolled his eyes. Just come here. She took her hands out of her pockets and blew on them. Might as well go all the way since she wasn't fooling him. I can warm up my hands. Why are you so stubborn? Get over here. He motioned to her. She huffed and sat down in front of him. All right. Here. She held out her hands. No, turn around. He twirled his finger. Why do you want me to turn around? What are you going to do? I'm going to warm you. There's a blizzard outside. The building has no power, which means no heat. The elevator isn't going to get warmer. It's only going to get colder. You've been frozen from the minute you stepped in here. I had to run back and forth to get the cupcakes into my van. Then, again here, to get them inside. There was too much snow to stack them on and will it in. Now I get it. Turn around. I'm just going to wrap myself around you and give you some of my body heat. How completely and utterly embarrassing, she said under her breath as she did as he told her. Take off your coat. She whirled around to look at him. What? How's that going to help? Just do it. I know what I'm talking about. She thought he was crazy, but she did it, anyway. Now, put it over you like a blanket. As Liam spoke, he snuggled up against her back and wrapped his arms around her. She immediately felt the warmth of him seeping into her back through her thin sweater. She pulled her coat to cover her, and Liam took her hands in as so her arms were crossed over her stomach. He threaded his fingers through hers. All of her embarrassment left her as the warmth from him carried through her. Her teeth stopped chattering. She leaned against him, her body melting into his. Better? He spoke in her ear and his warm breath brushed against her skin. He smelled of musky cologne and chocolate, probably from the cupcakes he'd eaten. She managed to nod. Yeah. That's better. So, tell me. Am I the only man you've snuggled with in a broken-down elevator? She forced herself to laugh, because the mood needed to be lightened. Hardly. Why, I've snuggled with men in elevators at least three times this week. 
maybe even four. It's become a disgusting habit. He pressed even closer to her. I'm disappointed. Her heart seemed to thump louder as she listened to the low timbre of his voice in her ear. Why? Because I thought I was special. Why did that send shivers over her skin? Not shivers of cold. Oh, no, she was no longer cold. Those kind of shivers would have been okay. Expected. No, they were the kind you get when you're attracted to someone. The kind that makes your heart thump and your skin feel like it's alive. The kind that were making her think about things she shouldn't be thinking about. Liam's strong arms around her sides. His fingers entwined with hers. His cologne. Candace closed her eyes and tried to think of something else. Anything else. She couldn't think of Liam Russell that way. Not only was he a bazillionaire who was probably not at all attracted to her. The man who was going to find out eventually who she was. Who her father was. She scoffed at him. Don't start getting too cocky. He chuckled in her ear. All right. I'm not special. I get it. As they sat, his chest pressed up against her back, Candace wondered if he had a girlfriend who might get upset if she learned he'd warmed up another woman in the elevator. He had said something about his ex, so maybe that meant he didn't have a girlfriend. But she felt weird just assuming. Finally, she couldn't stand it and had to ask. Don't take this the wrong way, but... Hold it. You're starting like that? Do you know what those words do to a guy? Uh, no? Let's just say nothing good ever followed, don't take this the wrong way. It's not bad. How can I think that? All that's coming to my mind right now is, don't take this the wrong way, but did you brush your teeth this morning, or don't take this the wrong way, but what kind of deodorant do you use? Because it's failing. I was just going to ask if you have a girlfriend. Sheesh. I'm not going to say you smell bad or anything. Oh. He sat as silence filled the elevator. Well, I'm glad I don't smell bad. Nope. Just the opposite. You mean I smell good? Why are you trying to get out of answering the question? He paused. Why do you want to know if I have a girlfriend? Oh, great. He does have one. She hated herself right now for even getting the smallest hope in her that he was single and that maybe he was interested in her. Stupid. Nothing. Never mind. It's fine. I was just starting to get self-conscious that your girlfriend wouldn't like me and you, you know, that's all. Me and you, you know? He chuckled. We're not doing anything. No. But this is kind of intimate, don't you think? What exactly are you implying? Nothing. She flushed. I just don't think your significant other would like you and me in this position right now. You don't have to worry. Did that mean what she thought it meant? She wasn't sure. Because she's out of town? No. Because I don't have a significant other. Oh. This was a weird conversation. And she kind of felt like he was flirting with her, but she wasn't sure, and she didn't even want him to be, right? So, she should not be reacting to his almost flirting. Liam grazed his thumb over her finger. So, I guess if I had been sent out by mean Mr. Russell to get mistletoe, I could use it right now. Now Candace was sure he was flirting. No question about it. He was, definitely. His chin brushed against the sensitive part of her neck and electricity zinged over her skin, derailing her train of thought. Yes. He was flirting. But did she want him to? Why was her stomach full of butterflies right now? Why did she feel like she was in high school, and the captain of the football team had noticed her? If she turned, her lips could meet his. A shiver went down her back at the thought. She swallowed. Too bad you don't have any, she said, forcing the words. Yeah. 
Too bad, he said softly. She needed to change the subject, and quickly, before she found herself turning around and sucking face with the man. He was too good-looking. Too warm. And too charming. What are you doing for Christmas other than getting together with your cousins and uncles? He chuckled. You want to know all our weird family traditions? You have weird family traditions? Of course, now I want to know. Spill. Okay, but it only sounds weird to people who don't know the background. She rolled her eyes. Tell me. It can't be that odd. His close proximity was sending an electric current over her skin, but she ignored it. She had to ignore it. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, we buy the largest, ugliest sale shoes we can find at the store. We decorate them, then on Christmas Eve, we set them by the fireplace, instead of hanging stockings, for Santa to fill with presents. Large shoes? Okay, that is odd. Why do you do that? Because when I was young, I learned about the children in the Netherlands. They put their shoes by the fire to receive gifts, and I thought that was a great idea. My parents indulged me, but they didn't want to put candy in my smelly sneakers, so they took me to the department store and told me to pick out a pair of shoes. And you picked a large pair, to get more presents. She smiled. That kind of evolved over the years. I realized I'd get more if I picked the largest ones. And then my cousins started doing it, too, and it became some kind of weird contest for who could find the oddest-looking pair of size 13 shoes. And the decorating? That evolved, too. We used plain shoes for a couple of years, but then I decided they would look better if they were more christmas Why? So, my mom bought paint and glue, and we went to town. Thinking of a young Liam, painting shoes to set out for Santa, made her smile. That is a great tradition. Isn't it? I think it should catch on. We should all be putting shoes by the fireplace. What do you do with them after Christmas? Oh, we save the Christmas shoes. We bring them out each year and use them for decorations. Although I think Mother throws out the especially ugly ones, because we suspiciously don't have as many as we should. You decorate with them? Yes. Mother doesn't love that part, so we kind of have to hide them. During the Christmas season, you can find them all over the house in obscure places. A Christmas shoe hunt. Liam laughed. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Now I want to go to your house. She said it before she knew what was coming out of her mouth, and she froze. She hadn't meant it like that, but it totally sounded like she was accepting his invitation to spend Christmas with his family. Good. Show up on Christmas morning and you can hunt all over the house for the shoes. I'll give you my mother's address. She didn't want to lock herself in, so she ignored his invitation. Did you decorate shoes this year? Of course. It's a huge ugly sweater contest between the cousins. Except we use shoes. She turned to give him a sideways glance. What about the people who could have bought and used those shoes? He shifted. We are saving those people from the ugliest shoes. The stores probably would never sell them. If you think about it, we're actually helping the economy. She left. All right. She stopped herself from admitting to him a second time that she really wanted to see the shoes now. She didn't need to commit herself to spending more awkward time with Liam Russell. Not when things were going to end badly between them. Chapter 7 Candace wanted to close her eyes. To melt into Liam's warmth and fall asleep. But she couldn't do that. They'd been chatting about nothing in particular while Liam cradled her, and now, after about a half hour, she could say she was sufficiently warm. She needed to suck it up and move away from him. Even though he smelled good. And it felt nice to be near him. She sighed and shifted so he'd let go of her. Thanks for warming me up. I feel much better now. She flipped her coat around and slid her arms through as she moved to a more appropriate distance from him. 
That's too bad. He smiled and a flush rushed through her. What did he mean by that? She eyed him. Why? His smile faded. You don't like it when I flirt with you, do you? Another surge of heat flowed up to her face. I'm just being practical. I don't see a point to flirting. We're not ever going to date. His eyebrows shut up and he leaned back on his hands. We aren't? Why not? His gaze seemed to look right through her. Like she was invisible, and he could see all the things she was hiding inside. She cleared her throat. Because you're just messing around. Who says I'm messing around? A challenging look came over him, and he loosened his tie and unbuttoned his top button. It made him look kind of sexy. She blinked. He couldn't be serious. I'm a nobody. You're, Liam Russell. She waved a hand at him. You're Stanford. She swallowed. I'm just a community college, she said quietly. So? You think I care where you went to college? She blew out a frustrated breath. It wasn't about that. But he didn't understand. He couldn't understand. He had no idea. She ran a hand through her hair. Never mind. No, you don't get to never mind me. We're stuck in here until the power comes back on or they send a rescue team. You can't avoid me. You have to answer this one. Why do you think I care where you went to college? Can't a man like me be interested in a woman like you? He wasn't going to give up on this. Fine. You want me to be blunt? He nodded, although she didn't miss the tiny flinch that crossed his features. Please do. I just don't think we'd work out together. That's all. He sat up. So, you're admitting it's not me. It's you. Anything to get him off this train of thought. She mentally crossed her fingers. Yes. It's me. I'm the one who wouldn't work in this equation. Because you're a community college. His lips held back a smile. All right, I admit that was dumb to say. No. It actually said a lot about you. He leaned closer to her. You're pragmatic. Yes. I am. I like pragmatic. Ugh. Why was he so intent on coming on to her? She was tired of his games. She stood up and walked to the other side of the elevator. Why are you doing this? He stood up, facing her. Doing what? He held out his hands. I'm not doing anything. Yes, you are. You're being all flirty and sexy, and it's just not fair. She folded her arms across her chest. He smiled and took a step toward her. You think I'm sexy? I think you think you're sexy. He cocked his head to the side and furrowed his brow. You didn't quite answer the question. She watched him come even closer as her heart picked up speed. I don't have to. He stopped in front of her. What are you afraid of, Candace? Her breath hitched. I'm not afraid of anything. Then why are you backing away from me? She hadn't realized she was, but he was right. She was now pressed up against the wall. She sighed. I just don't think we're compatible. Why not? She didn't have an answer for him. Mostly, because it was a blatant lie. She thought they were very compatible. She liked him. Too much. She didn't answer. He took her hands in his. You're warm. Was she? She hadn't realized she'd warmed up that much. It must have been you. He stood there for a moment, his thumbs grazing across the backs of her hands. It sent tiny zaps through her. He leaned closer. I wish I had been sent out to get mistletoe. Her gaze dipped to his lips. She couldn't help it. 
even in the dim lighting, looking at his lips, stirred a fluttering in her belly. She suddenly didn't know why she was resisting him. She liked the guy. He was kind and had a good heart. She'd said some pretty mean things about him before she knew who he was, and he'd forgiven her outright. His reputation around town was that he was a bit stuffy. And she could see that. But he was also a trusting man. He'd opened up to her about his accident. Told her things about his family traditions. He was the kind of man she'd love to get to know better. But she was Harold Griffin's daughter. And as soon as he figured that out, he would not look at her the same way he was right now. She forced herself to look into his eyes. But you weren't. Nope. His gaze softened. But maybe you'll forgive me if I take some liberties. He dipped his head and kissed her. The action surprised her for a split second, but then she closed her eyes and let the kiss happen. His lips were warm. Soft. Seconds ticked by, but it felt like an eternity as his lips danced with hers. She never did this. Kissed a man she'd just met. It felt reckless. Slightly dangerous. And completely thrilling. Liam wrapped his arms around her and pulled her closer to him, and she slid her hands up his arms. His lips skimmed over hers, sending waves of pleasure through her. She let go of her inhibitions and deepened the kiss. She knew in the back of her mind that kissing Liam wasn't a good idea, but she didn't care. At this point, all she cared about was that he was everything she wanted in a man, and he wanted her. The lights came back on and the elevator jerked to life. Candace was so shocked, she jumped away from Liam, as if the lights uncovered her secret of who she really was. She pressed the back of her hand to her lips. Oh my gosh, we're moving again. Great. Another Captain Obvious moment. Gah. Liam seemed annoyed. Yes. Opportune timing. He shoved his hands into his pockets. T this is good, she stammered. We can get out of here. I wasn't in any hurry, he said under his breath as he slipped his shoes on. She ignored the comment and grabbed the things she'd tossed from her pockets. By the time the elevator doors opened, they looked all put together, and standing, just as two people in an elevator should. A woman rushed at Liam and took him in an embrace. Oh, dear. Are you okay? Of course, mother. I'm fine. We weren't in there for that long. An hour and a half. The woman pulled back and huffed at him. She looked just as you would expect a mother of a wealthy man to look. Her hair pulled up in some fancy updo. Designer clothes. And so many rings her fingers must get tired. And no one up here seemed to care about the power outage. They just kept the party going. As they talked, Candace wheeled out the cart full of cupcakes. Liam smiled at his mother. That's good. We paid for a lot of catering. And an open bar. I know, but you were stuck. I was fine. Liam motioned to Candace. Mother, this is Candace. Candace, this is my mother, Tina. Candace gave his mother a smile. Nice to meet you. Oh, you poor thing, trapped in the elevator with him. Are you hungry? You look hungry. We still have plenty of food. His mother grabbed her hand and pulled her down the hallway in some attempt to be motherly to her. I'm glad everyone is still here because we have several dozen cupcakes that need to be eaten. Liam grabbed the cart and wheeled it after them. I can do that, Candace said, feeling self-conscious. I've got it. Liam continued to push it down the hall. They entered the office. The space was open, like a large loft, with a huge row of windows showing the snowfall. Christmas music blasted from someone's phone and everyone seemed to be celebrating the lights being back on. Conversations filled the room and people crowded around the open bar to get more drinks. Liam pushed the cart against the wall and opened the top box of cupcakes. 
We have dessert, he called out. The crowd applauded. Hey, I heard you were trapped in the elevator, someone called out. Liam nodded. Yes, but I lived through it. His gaze met Candace's, and he winked at her. Butterflies stirred in her belly. She gave him a weak smile, then ducked her head. Come on, dear. Fill up your plate, Tina said, pulling her to the wall of food. Candace could see there was no way she was going to get out of staying at the party. At least for a small while. She grabbed a plate and stabbed a piece of chicken sitting in a warmer. All right. She filled her plate, grabbed a glass of water, then made her way over to an empty chair. A moment later, Liam joined her. There was no other spot to sit, so he leaned up against the wall. He set his drink next to hers. I'm glad you didn't leave. I don't think I could have. His fork froze midair. Did you want to? She shrugged and took another bite, not intending to answer the question. Liam frowned, a pained expression on his face. Kissing me was that bad? Candace choked on her bite and picked up her water to gulp down what was in her mouth. And to give her time to think about what she was going to say. When she drained her water and had nothing else to put off answering Liam, she set her empty cup down and shook her head. No. Quite the opposite. Kissing him was that good. So good, she lost her head over it. She forgot that Liam Russell was outside what was possible in her life. And forgetting that was not good. His gaze softened. Are you still in love with your ex? She swallowed, feeling the color drained from her face. No, she said, maybe too forcefully. Then she scoffed. Why would you ask that? Because you're either still in love with him or you just don't like me. And I'm trying hard not to take your multiple rejections, personally. She stared at him, her mouth going dry, unsure of what to say. Chapter 8 Liam's gaze pinned her to her chair. Candace fought for a rational thought to enter her head. She sighed and sank into her chair. It's not you. He didn't waver. I'm finding that harder and harder to believe. I just don't think we are. Compatible, he answered for her. I know. You said that. He frowned. What I can't understand is why you think that. Maybe she could get him to understand. What do you do for fun? She expected him to say golfing or something similarly stuffy and CEO-like. He got a funny look on his face. I like to do a lot of things for fun. What was the last thing you did in your spare time? I went antiquing. The words didn't quite register at first and Candace opened her mouth to tell him how much she hated his fun pastime, but then she realized what he said, and she froze. You did? Yes. Why? She shook her head. Never mind. What else do you do for fun? I restore furniture. He smiled. Which is why I go antiquing. She wanted to scoff at him and tell him they had nothing in common, but instead, her emotion surged. My father used to restore antiques, too. That was probably why she loved them so much. Liam seemed pleased. He did? That's amazing. She closed her eyes, remembering how her father would stay up late, working in the garage on a piece. The strong smell of the wood finish he'd use. It took her back for a moment. She gazed up at Liam. He took great care with the pieces he worked on. There's something about taking an old, discarded piece and bringing it back to life. He shook his head. I just love that. Candace stared at the floor. Why couldn't it have been simpler? Why couldn't they be so different that it wouldn't work between them? Why did he have to be so kind and so sexy? Why did he have to be the perfect guy for her? His mother waved at him from across the office space. Liam. Come here. I want you to hear this story. Liam nodded to her. 
be right there. His gaze dipped to Candace. I'd better go. He worked his jaw for a moment. Stay here. I'll only be a minute. He gave her one last look, before he shoved himself off the wall and headed toward his mother. Candace stared down at her plate, guilt surging in her. She felt terrible. He'd treated her with nothing but kindness, and she'd been rude at first, then just standoffish. Why did he even like her? A woman came up to her and took Liam's place against the wall. She looked Candace over before motioning to Liam. You Liam's date? Candace about spit out the olive in her mouth. She swallowed. No. Oh. Okay. I just thought maybe, because he never brings women to things like this. And he was looking at you kind of like he wanted to devour you or something. He ordered the cupcakes from me. She made a face. Really? She left off the rest, but her eyes said it all the same. Then why are you still here? Candace stared out the window. The snow still fell against the darkened sky. Her van was probably buried under a thousand feet of the stuff. Great. The woman took a drink of her cocktail. Well, if you've got your sights on him, hopefully you won't be too disappointed when he shoots you down. That's just how Liam is. The cattiness was getting to Candace. That's interesting because he asked me out, and I shot him down. I thought maybe he was just the flirty type. The woman jerked her head around and narrowed her eyes at Candace. He did? Yes. Why did you shoot him down? Liam's got more money than Chicago. She waved her hand around the air, like that indicated how rich he was. Maybe this woman had had a little too much Christmas cheer. Candace politely smiled. Well, I don't care about that. She looked at Candace like she was too stupid to know that money was important. Candace suddenly wanted to get out of there. Liam had wanted her to stay, but he looked pretty engrossed in his conversation and wasn't coming back anytime soon. Besides, what was there to say? She needed to get away from him. Excuse me. I think I need to dig out my van. You didn't park in the garage? Nope. I parked on the street. She didn't want to say she thought she'd just be a few minutes. What a night this was turning out to be. Pity formed on the woman's face. Oh, you poor thing. You'd better go dig out, then. Do you have a shovel? I always keep one in my van. Candace stood and gave the woman a half wave. Bye. She placed her paper plate in the trash can and headed to the door. Liam didn't look at her to see her leaving. That was probably for the best. She needed to get home and soak in a hot bath. This day had been a roller coaster of emotions, and she needed to get them settled down. Just as the office door swung shut behind her, she thought she heard Liam call out, Candace, wait. But she wasn't positive. Still, she hurried her steps to the elevators. There was nothing more to say to Liam Russell. She pressed the button and the elevator door slid open immediately. Wait, she heard, louder, but this time she pressed the door shut button on purpose. Guilt assaulted her as Liam's foot once again came into view and the door slid back open. He stepped into the elevator, which, incidentally, still smelled like him. He frowned at her. You're leaving so soon? She avoided his gaze. Sorry. I realized I had a thing. Ugh. Lamest excuse ever. Why couldn't she ever think of a better excuse? Someone called in an emergency cupcake order? His eyebrows raised. A thing? She pressed the first floor button and the elevator began descending. Yeah, she said to her shoes. All right. What about your cart? You left it upstairs. Crud. In her haste to get away from that whole awkward situation, she'd forgotten about the cart. I'll come back after Christmas and get it. Why wasn't the elevator going faster? 
they were only on floor 60. It seemed to be crawling. Liam stepped in front of her. Why are you running from me? I'm not. He reached out and placed a finger on her lips. A thrill rushed through her at the contact. You are. I just can't figure out why. You're not married, are you? She shook her head as he lifted his finger. No. You're not seeing anyone? No. You don't hate me? Her gaze snapped up to his, and she felt even more guilty. No. Of course not. I rather like you. Then why? Candace bit her lip. He obviously was the persistent type who wouldn't give up or go away until she said something. He was going to make her tell him. She took in a breath and let it out slowly. Your leg. Wait, what? He looked at her like she had grown a third eye. You won't date me because of my leg? No, that's not what I'm saying. Then what is it about my leg? Candace swallowed down the acid in her throat. She couldn't do it. She couldn't tell him what her last name was. She couldn't tell him she was the daughter of the man who had caused him so much pain. Never mind. I don't understand. You said my leg. She pressed her lips to his, silencing him. She didn't want to explain. And this seemed to be the only way to shut him up. At least, it was an enjoyable way to silence him. He pulled her close, his kiss more aggressive this time. She pressed her palms against his chest and was surprised at the strength she found there. His kiss permeated through her thoughts. Made her dizzy and her knees weak. Candace, he whispered, breathless as he entwined his fingers in her hair. What? she whispered back. Don't you feel the electricity between us? The raw energy that flows through us every time we touch? That's just chemistry. I know. But I've never felt it this strong. With anyone. He closed his eyes and kissed her neck. The elevator slowed, then stopped and the door slid open. Great. Now it decided to get to the ground floor. He sighed and stepped back from her. Don't you want to explore this? He motioned between them. What we have. Before she could get her senses back, she said what was on the tip of her tongue. Yes, she whispered. Yes. Did I hear you correctly? He stepped between the doors so they wouldn't shut. She nodded, unable to stop the smile from forming on her lips. Yes. I want to. She would find a way to tell him about her father. Later. She just wanted to embrace this new relationship, feeling that was spreading from her toes through her body. He held out his hand and she took it. Dang, girl, you sure know how to make a guy work for what he wants. Chapter 9 Candace stood in the snowdrifted street and looked at the mound that used to be her van. Let me drive you home, Liam said over the wind. How will I get my van back? I'll have maintenance dig you out. She debated, then looked up at the sky. All right. I can take a cab back here in the morning. Come on. He tugged on her hand. She followed him back into the building. We'll have to take the elevator. She squinted at him. Wait, if your car is in the lower level, why were you getting on the elevator on the ground floor when I was bringing up the cupcakes? I wasn't coming from my car. They entered the elevator. Where were you coming from, she asked. He grinned. Outside. She scoffed. What were you doing outside? Hiding. She hadn't expected him to say that. From what? Don't you mean, from whom? Yes, I probably do. She poked him in the side. Who were you hiding from? He rolled his eyes. Let's just say there are a few office women who want nothing more than to trap me and force me to listen to them talk all night long. Oh. Yeah, I think I met one of them today. 
lucky you, he said under his breath. The elevator stopped and they stepped out into the parking garage. He pulled out his key FOB from his pocket and pressed the button. His car chirped and lights blinked. She stared at the fancy sports car. Is that an Audi? Yes. He opened the door for her. One of my other pastimes is driving fast. She laughed as she slid into his car. I guess so. He started the car and pulled out of the parking garage after getting her address. The streets had recently been plowed, but snow still came down. As Liam drove, he reached out and took her hand in his. I hope this doesn't sound cheesy, but I feel a strong connection to you that I can't explain. Candace tried not to grin like a silly schoolgirl. I feel it, too. I've never had this happen to me before. You must think I'm always coming on to women, but this is something special. I can't explain it. She couldn't explain it, either. Maybe going through the stressful situation of being trapped in the elevator together had brought them closer. Maybe it had sparked something in them that would have lain dormant had they not been in such close quarters for that time. She wasn't sure, but she couldn't deny it any longer. She and Liam had something between them. What's your favorite season? Liam asked. Candace chewed on that for a moment. I really love the fall, where the leaves turn colors and the landscape is so beautiful. But I love the spring as well, where the flowers are just peeking up and everything is coming back to life. It's a cycle of death and then new life, and I can't decide if I like the death part or the new life part better. Liam made a face. Well, when you say it that way, spring sounds much better than fall. She left. I know. But really, the leaves all die and fall off. Everything goes into a sleep for winter. Sleep and reawakening sounds better to me than death and rebirth. You're right. They chatted about nothing in particular as Liam made his way to her apartment building. By the time they arrived, the snowfall had stopped. They got out of the car and walked to the front door. Do you want to come in? I can make you some hot chocolate. That sounds good. Candace led him inside and got her keys out of her pocket. For some reason, she was suddenly nervous to have him inside her apartment. She chalked it up to the newness of their relationship. And the way he made her skin tingle when he was near. She unlocked her door and flipped on her living room light. Make yourself at home. I'll go get the cocoa going. Sure, he said as he looked around. She bustled in the kitchen, taking out the ingredients for her favorite hot chocolate recipe as Liam leafed through the magazines that sat on her end table. What a day this had turned out to be. Daniel, coming in the shop and destroying her. And now Liam Russell was in her living room, and he was so different from what she expected. She grabbed the cocoa powder and rummaged through her drawer to find the measuring cups. Liam came into the kitchen and stood behind her. Need any help? Sure. She handed him the measuring cup and the cocoa powder. I just need one fourth cup. He helped her get the ingredients in the saucepan. How long have you lived here? In this apartment? Yes. Two years. I was living with my father before he passed. I'm sorry. It is what it is. I miss him a lot, especially around the holidays. Liam put his arms around her from behind. I'm sure you do. He pressed his lips to her neck and she closed her eyes, melting into him. Okay, now what do we need to do? She handed him a wooden spoon and pointed to the saucepan. Stir this as it heats up. Then I'll pour the milk in and it will be ready soon. You got it. Candace pulled the milk out. Do you want whipped cream on top of yours? He grinned. Is there any other way to make hot chocolate? There is, but that's the dumb way. She grabbed the whipped cream while he laughed. Liam snaked a hand around her waist and pulled her to him. You know, I'm glad the elevator got stuck on floor 56. 
Me, too, she confessed. He brushed his lips over hers before returning to his stirring duty. After the cocoa was ready and poured into mugs, Candace and Liam returned to the living room to sit on her couch. She snuggled into him. Even though they just met a few hours ago, it felt natural. Like she'd known him so much longer. He sipped his cocoa. This is good. Thanks. So, are you going to come over for Christmas? I never got a definite answer from you. She smiled at him, even though in her gut something pulled her back. A niggling inside that told her it wasn't a good idea. She shoved that aside and nodded. I'd love to. Did you put the milk away? She blinked. Had she? I don't remember. She left. You were distracting me. I'll go check. She hopped up and walked into the kitchen. Sure enough, she'd left it sitting on the stovetop. You're right. I didn't put it away, she called to him. Mmm, he said as he looked at something on her end table. When she walked back into the living room, she froze. He had a photo frame in his hand. He slowly turned to her. This is your father? He turned the photo around. She'd forgotten she had that picture out. It was the last photo of her and her father together. Her mouth went dry. Yes, she whispered. Your father is the man who broke my leg? Liam's expression was unreadable. Candace couldn't breathe. She was going to tell him, but not right now. She was going to find a way to bring it up, slowly. So he could get used to the idea. But here he was, staring at her like she'd betrayed him. Yes. Disappointment registered on his face. And you knew? This whole time? Why didn't you say something? All kinds of things flashed through her mind. She wanted to. She thought about it. She didn't want to get close to him for this very reason. But none of them came out of her mouth. Instead, she just shook her head. Do you know what this man did to me? The pain I went through? Candace blinked. This wasn't happening. This is exactly what she feared. But still, no words would form. He tossed the photo on the couch and stood. I have to go. She was powerless to stop him. He left her standing in her kitchen, her heart ripping apart. Chapter 10 Liam didn't feel like being with family. His leg hurt and he wasn't in the mood. But it was Christmas Eve, and he'd promised he'd bring the eggnog. Plus, he'd never missed a Christmas Eve with his cousins. He entered his mother's house, careful not to show his limp too much or she would ask him what was wrong. He closed the large front door. He always thought his home was a mansion growing up because of the two-story columns out front. In reality, it was just a large home. Of course, it was decorated to the hilt, as she always did this season. Wreaths and garland, white twinkle lights and golden bows. It felt like home, and he tried to push all thoughts of Candace away so he could enjoy the holiday. She called out to him as he took his coat off. Liam. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mother. He kissed her cheek. She looked behind him. Where's your friend? I thought she was coming. Had he mentioned Candace? He'd forgotten. His stomach clenched. She's not coming. His mother's eyes widened. Why not? I thought you liked her. Turns out she was lying to me. But let's not talk about it. I'd rather focus on eating and having fun. Amanda, his cousin closest to his age, came into the entryway. Liam. You made it. She looked around. Where's your girlfriend? A sinking feeling pulled on his gut as he turned to his mother. You told everyone I was bringing a girlfriend? She avoided his gaze. I'm sorry. I thought she was coming. 
she's not. Liam inwardly groaned. He was going to have to push through these next few minutes before everyone found out he was a loser without a date, and then hopefully everyone would move on. Amanda looped her arm through his and tugged him toward the kitchen. It's okay. I made my famous chocolate chip double fudge cookies. Good. Because I need them right now. He could stuff about a dozen in his face. Amanda laughed. They entered the kitchen. His cousin Greg and his wife Sheila were sitting on bar stools. Amanda's younger sister, Kathleen, stopped icing a sugar cookie to give him a hug. A few other cousins milled about. Hey, Kathleen said, where's your girl? Greg looked up. Liam has a girl? You didn't hear? Kathleen grinned. He got stuck in an elevator with her. What? Greg hopped off his stool to shoulder bump Liam. Tell me about her. There's nothing to tell. She's not coming. We're not dating. Liam grabbed one of Amanda's cookies. What happened? Kathleen said. I thought you were making googly eyes at her. Oh, heavens. Would this ever end? Liam shoved the cookie in his mouth. This is good, he said around the cookie, hoping to steer the conversation away from Candace. Come on. Tell us what happened, Greg said. You couldn't have screwed this up that badly. Maybe we can help you fix it. He shook his head. No fixing. She lied to me. End of story. Amanda squinted at him. You mean, you told her not to come because she lied? About what? Crud. They weren't going to let this go. He was going to have to tell them the whole story. She's Harold Griffin's daughter. The room sat quiet and he looked around for a reaction. You know who Harold Griffin is, don't you? The man who ruined my life. His mother frowned, placing her hand on her cheek. Of course, we know who he is. But why would you say such a thing? It was an accident. Liam studied her. I heard you talking in hushed whispers when I was a child. I know the accident was his fault. I know he should have been ticketed. And I know he got away with it. His mother's gaze softened. Honey. We may have said some things right after the accident happened, but we were worried we'd lose you. We were upset Harold wasn't charged. But your father was at fault as well. Harold ran a stoplight, but your father was turning on a solid red arrow. Harold wasn't charged because they both were at fault. But do you know what that man did? After he found out you were in the hospital with extensive injuries, he insisted on sending a check. He wanted to help pay the hospital bill because he knew we didn't have great insurance. He sent us a check every month until his mother grew emotional and wiped at her eyes. Liam stood still, barely breathing. He had not known this. All he'd heard was the outrage his parents had right after the accident. The shouts of injustice. He had harbored anger toward Harold Griffin his whole life because he thought he was a terrible man. But he was wrong. He had perceived things through the eyes of a child. He had not understood that a car accident can happen within a split second. He was just a little boy who suffered an enormous thing no boy should have to go through. His mother walked to Liam and put her arms around him. Do you still hold Harold responsible for what happened? Because no matter what the past was, you can't have that pain in your heart. It will do you no good. Liam closed his eyes. He did not want to admit he'd carried this weight around with him for years. Look around you, his mother said. It's Christmas. We celebrate every year with cookies and presents, but the real gift of Christmas doesn't come in a package. The real gift of Christmas is the redeeming power of our Savior. That is what Christmas is all about. Emotions swelled in Liam. I know, he said quietly. You have to let your heart heal. Let him heal you. Forgive Harold for what happened. 
It's the only way you'll have peace. His mother hugged him. Liam felt his mother's words pierce his heart. Yes, he said. I do. Even as he said the words, he felt a load lighten from him. She spoke the truth. Amanda wiped a tear from her eye, then put her arm around Liam's shoulders. Go talk to that woman. You need to. He nodded, understanding flooding in. He'd treated her like it was her fault, and she was not to blame. No one was. He could see it now. You're right. His mother patted his arm. Yes. Go talk to her. And don't come back until you fix things with her. Chapter 11 Candace packaged up the last of the sugar cookies and handed the bag to the customer. Here you go. That's all we have. Well, I'm glad you had any. The last three stores I tried were sold out of gluten-free. He pulled out his wallet. I hope you enjoy them, Candace said as she swiped his credit card. The store was closing in five minutes, which was good because they were practically out of everything. She'd sent Debbie home early after the cupcakes sold out. All they had left were a few creme puffs. I'm sure we will. The customer took back his card and turned to leave. Merry Christmas, he said over his shoulder as he walked out of the store. Candace brushed her hands off on her apron and looked at the clock. Three more minutes. Then she could turn off the open sign and collapse. She'd been pushing away the memories of yesterday, all day today. She couldn't believe she'd behaved in such a way. The door dinged and she called out, we're out of almost everything. Then she turned and saw Liam, and all thoughts came to a screeching halt. Candace. He said it softly, like an apology. But she'd held her breath for an apology from Daniel, too, and look how that had turned out. She stiffened. Liam. He took a step toward her, then hesitated, fiddling with his fingers. I shouldn't have left like that yesterday, he said. He swallowed and worked his jaw. It was wrong. She blinked. It was to be expected. How else would he have reacted to finding out who she was? Liam winced. No. I shouldn't have gotten upset. It was a shock to find out who your father was, but that's all. I should have stayed. I should have talked to you about it. A heaviness pressed down on her chest and she struggled to breathe. It's okay. I understand. No, you don't. Liam walked to her and stopped right in front of her. I was a child when the accident happened. I looked at it through the eyes of a child. I blamed your father when I shouldn't have. I never knew your father sent money every month. She held back a bitter laugh. He sent money because he was forced to. Your father sued him and got a judgment. Liam's eyes widened. No, that's not what happened. There was no lawsuit. Candace almost choked. No lawsuit? She thought back to what her father had told her. Had he ever mentioned a lawsuit, or had she just assumed? What? she asked, her voice small. No one sued anyone. The accident was no fault because both cars ran a red light. Your father paid because he knew I had a lot of bills. He knew I was the one who suffered. Liam swallowed. He did it out of the goodness of his heart. Her father had never told her that. Every time she'd ask, he said he was sending the money because I have to. She thought that meant a lawsuit, but it must have meant he felt like he had an obligation. But her father was like that. He had convictions, and he stuck with them. She just wished she hadn't spent her childhood resenting Liam. She never knew the truth. Candace looked at her feet. I didn't know any of that. I didn't, either. Liam cleared his throat and reached out to tuck a strand of her hair behind her ear. I spent a lot of years hating your father. She sucked in a breath. And I spent a lot of years resenting you. 
I guess we both need a little Christmas in our lives. She squinted at him, confused. What? Someone reminded me today what Christmas is really about. He touched the side of her face, and she melted into the palm of his hand. Do you forgive me, Candace? Her heart pounded as the warmth from him flowed over her. Yes. Will you come spend Christmas with my family? She nodded, then wrapped her arms around his neck and pressed her lips to his. He readily kissed her back, taking her breath away. After he pulled back, she smiled at him. I could easily fall in love with you, Liam Russell. And I never thought I'd say those words in a million years. He chuckled. Those words just made my heart happy. Epilogue Candace laughed, tears streaming down her cheeks. You can't be serious. He put his underwear in the freezer. Liam's face turned another shade of red. Do we have to talk about all the embarrassing things I did as a child? It's Christmas Day. Shouldn't we be singing carols or something? They all sat in Tina's living room, so many members of the family gathered around she couldn't name them all. Candace was snuggled up against Liam's side. She held up her hand. But wait. I want to know why you put your underwear in the freezer. Amanda grinned. He thought it was too hot outside. So, his solution was to freeze his underwear so he could put it on and have it cool himself down. That is so cute. Candace patted Liam's knee. You are a practical child. Tina straightened her back. It wasn't so cute when I opened the freezer to get ice and found his underwear instead. Wait, 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 Greg said. Was it clean, or did he take off the pair he had been wearing? Oh, I was going commando, Liam said, and the whole room busted up laughing. Tina made a face. I did not need to know that. Amanda jumped up. I think it's time to open presents. Kanda squirmed, feeling a bit self-conscious. She had not had much time to get presents for everyone, so she'd wrapped up gift certificates to her bakery. Liam kissed the top of her head, seemingly knowing exactly what she was uncomfortable with. They'll love them, he whispered. She'd only known him for three days, but Candace knew in her heart he was the man for her. She smiled up at him, emotions swelling in her. You're perfect, you know, she whispered back. Amanda climbed over the mound of squirming kids trying to get at the presents to hand a gift to Candace. This is for you from all of us. She blinked. What? I wasn't expecting anything. Amanda just smiled at her and went back to handing out presents. Candace looked up at Liam. What is this? Just a little something the family thought you'd like. It was the size of a shoebox, maybe a bit larger, and when she shook it, she could hear things rattling around inside. I'm so curious. Well, open it, Amanda called. The kids were already tearing into their presents. Liam smiled and nudged her. Yeah, open it. Candace tore the paper off. It was a shoebox. She opened it and saw the largest, ugliest pair of tan walking shoes she'd ever seen. And then she noticed the paint and brush in the box and grinned. I get to make some Christmas shoes? Tina laughed. Liam told us you found this silly tradition of ours fascinating. Candace nodded. She'd spent the morning playing find the shoe with Liam and had a blast. I think it's wonderful. And I can't believe I get to join in the fun. I can't wait to see what you come up with, Amanda said. From the cupcakes you brought, I can tell you're creative. Candace had gotten up early and made her famous Santa hat cupcakes for the family. She was used to getting up early, and she knew Liam's mother had celiac, so she probably didn't get to partake in a lot of the Christmas goodies. I haven't given you my present yet. Liam held a secret behind his eyes. Where is it? It's not something I can wrap. Candace raised her eyebrows. Oh. Just tell her, Amanda called out from across the room. The family laughed. 
Liam grinned. All right. For my Christmas present to you, I'm going to send in a review of Cupcake Bliss to the Chicago Tribune. Her vision blurred as she blinked back tears. You are? Yes. I'm also going to post it on Yelp and everywhere else I can find. Your cupcakes are the best I've ever tasted, and they're gluten-free, which a lot of people need. I want to help your business survive. A tear escaped down her cheek, and he brushed it away. Don't cry. I can't help it. My shop needs the publicity so badly. I can't thank you enough. You don't have to thank me. I'm happy to do it. She gave Liam a kiss, then turned to his family, warm feelings coursing through her. Thank you all for making me feel welcome. This has been a wonderful Christmas. She gazed into Liam's eyes, and emotion swelled in her again. She felt like she was home. Like this was where she belonged. This truly was a blessed Christmas. The End you have been listening to Cupcakes and Kisses, a novella written by Victorini Liskey. If you enjoyed this book, check out my other audiobooks on this YouTube channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Thank you for listening, and for your support. It means the world to me.